This is an extraordinary story. The cost is in excess of three million pounds. People weren't quite sure whether we were serious people at all or a van would arrive with men in white coats and get the car off. A journey that took 18 years. Involving hundreds of people. That is the big thing. It's the people's faces when they see it. I liken it somewhat to sitting in the hospital while your wife's having a baby. To build a brand new mainline steam engine from scratch. It's a celebration that's been a long time in the making. In 1990, four men came together to discuss an ambitious idea. Dreamt up by Mike Wilson, it soon caught the imagination of financial expert David Champion, solicitor Stuart Palmer, yes. and locomotive engineer Ian Storey. Two decades later, they've come back together to reflect on what happened next. It was just an idea that came to me, and I said, well, why don't we do something different that well, 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 let's build an engine, you know, yeah. and uh, let's build an A1. In the early days, you and I went to see, was it, was it Yorkshire Bank? It was a bit of a eureka moment because since 1964 I'd been waiting for somebody else to do it and I thought, it, it, there was just a light went on and I thought, this is it. You this know, is the moment I get on board. Uh, that's it. I hadn't been involved in steam preservation because preservation itself didn't particularly interest me. But the idea of building from new, wow. <laughs> David Champion brought the group together at his house. First on the agenda, could a locomotive the size of an A1 still be built from scratch? I knew that all the parts could be manufactured. Uh, there's nothing, they can't be manufactured for a steam engine. Uh, the boiler, um, at that particular time, 20 years ago, people were actually rolling boiler shells, you know, doing just about a whole firebox repair. The A1s were designed by Arthur Peppercorn. He was the last chief mechanical engineer of the London and North Eastern Railway. He imagined a class of three-cylinder Pacific locomotives which were economic, versatile and powerful. Even though the railways were soon nationalised, British Railways went ahead with the construction of 49 A1s at Doncaster and Darlington Works. None survived the scrapman's torch but building a new one would mean relearning old skills and a lot of money. Well, after we'd had the meeting in the dining room with all four of us, and I thought, well, we've got the beginnings of a good professional team. Um, I had no doubt that we'd find a method to uh, do it, to get a business plan and a financing plan together, but it just wouldn't come for quite a while. And one lovely summer's evening in summer of 1990, um, I was just finishing off a particularly good bottle of red wine after dinner and I just felt as if the creative juices were starting to flow so I walked in to here, took out a piece of paper and a pen and just started writing away and it, with 20 minutes later I just got to the, to the end of it and I remember writing those last three words where it says that this will work. People say, say this is remarkable but what I think is odd about it is, it is quite unremarkable because I think everything on there is quite simple logic. David's original project plan depended on 1,000 like-minded people joining in. If they all gave a small amount of money every week, a donation described as a covenant, then over a decade, £1 million could be raised. <laughs> the notes you made as the, the, their effect is as true now as it was then. You said, such a large project needs two things. First, the best business organisation by a professional businessmen. Secondly, a funding system able to supply the unprecedented amounts of cash. I mean, that, that really is, is, is the summary of what it was all about. And rather than build a replica of one of the first 49 A1s, another important principle was established from the start. The new locomotive would have its own identity, 
as the 50th member of the class. It was time for the project and the funding method to be unveiled to the wider world at a public meeting in York. I thought it would go well because we'd been dripping out stories for some time in the railway press saying we've got the way of doing it. People weren't quite sure whether we were serious people at all or whether after the presentation a van would arrive with men in white coats and cart us off. Um, but we were completely confident of the, the method. At the end of the presentation, I, I said, I'll write uh, out the first covenant just to show to people that you could take out multiple covenants. I took out the first multiple covenant and we actually ran out of forms. I'd only taken a hundred with me, but all hundred were signed by the end of that meeting. Over the next few months, more presentations followed. And each time, more people were signing up to the cause. The A1 Steam Locomotive Trust was born. And the plan wasn't just attracting money. Hiya. Hello. David Elliott was an early recruit. I've got a background of railway engineering, and at the time I was doing contracts and commercial work in the aviation industry, and they thought this might be useful. Well, I've been involved in several preservation and restoration projects and I've always found it rather frustrating that we seem to be spending a lot of time rebuilding and refurbishing old pieces of equipment which really ought to have been thrown away and replaced in any logical and sensible engineering environment. Uh, and when the chance came up to build a new locomotive, I realised this wasn't going to be an issue anymore. Can you start with the one at the top, Alan? Yes, I can. It's the washer to go with. Yes. Uh, nut 13 and bolt. So how do you actually want it to... The number one priority was, are there any drawings for the locomotives in existence? Because if we had had to sit down and redraw this locomotive from scratch, it would have probably double the total amount of effort required because we would have effectively been designing a new complex machine to run on the railway. Fortunately, our early inquiries showed that the National Railway Museum possessed nearly all the drawings for this locomotive. Unfortunately, these drawings were in random rolls as they'd been effectively rescued out of a skip several years earlier when the locomotive works had been throwing out all the steam drawings. We started a, a process at York which involved small teams going in for periods of two or three days at a time over what was effectively a two-year period, going through thousands of drawings. We estimate at the end that we actually looked at 20,000 drawings, which was virtually the entire collection that came out of the former Doncaster works. And out of those, we identified uh, around about 1,100 drawings which either did apply to our locomotive or might apply to it. It was very new back in then, the idea of doing uh, full-scale full digital scanning of drawing. The biggest problem was trying to convince the National Railway Museum that this machine that we were going to bring in was not going to damage this unique and valuable collection of original drawings. A project like this was looked at as something of a nuisance. We were now going in and effectively taking this reading room over and demanding a large amount of time and effort while they went and found various material for us. I must say it's only one stage removed from watching paint dry after a while. <laughs> Incidentally, we're not talking about paper drawings for the most part. The process in the old days was that a draftsman made a drawing in pencil or on paper and then a tracer once it was finished, traced the whole drawing onto linen using Indian ink. And this formed the durable, storage, storable copy. And using what were then quite revolutionary machines, these could be printed out uh, using an optical process onto light-sensitive paper to produce the drawings that were used in the workshop. So what we were copying were these linen original drawings and they're basically translucent and some of them are really artistic pieces of work. They're, they're lovely to handle but the trouble is after they've been used dozens of times to take copies from inevitably they become cracked and dirty. And so the first two or three years myself and three other volunteers spent a lot of time on computer electronically cleaning all the drawings. And if you look at the drawings now they're almost as good as new. The drawings were saved onto computer tape, but the details were incomplete. A study of the sole surviving and similar Peppercorn A2 Blue Peter provided some of the answers. But the new A1 would also have some important differences to its predecessors. There were obviously things that we were already thinking about 
to change the basic design. Uh, one example being the fitting of air brakes, because a traditionally steam locomotive uh, used a vacuum brake to, to operate on the train. But also we have since had to think about incorporating modern safety electronic systems and a variety of other bits and pieces. Another early recruit was marketing man Mark Allett, an LNER enthusiast with the right contacts to raise the profile of the project. The entire approach that the project took from day one was, was completely different, where fundraising was put absolutely at the heart of the project, because it was recognised that the amount of money needed to, ra to raise to build a locomotive was vastly more than to restore one. And um, publicity also was an important part of the project from day one. And even without their own locomotive, there were always ways to raise income, like arranging rail tours. Hello, we're raffling off the uh, headboard, six to five pounds or a pound each, in each direction. The idea of getting involved in a new project, building a new steam locomotive, of the types that I like, just really appealed. I think the biggest challenge right from that time was from the people who said it won't happen, it can't happen, you'll never do it. It was the sceptics, the people who didn't believe that with enough determination and will then that then all of the problems could be overcome. Despite the doubters, the project marched on. With money coming in and the plans available, three years after the idea was born, preparations for a physical start were being made. Once we had the drawing, it was then a case of working out a project plan as to how we were actually going to start cutting metal, so that once we started doing it, it went bang, 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 bang. There would always be something following on. The A1 Roadshow arrived in Doncaster with the simple message, an A1 for the price of a pint, referring to the weekly amount Covenanters had to pledge. The Trust and the Council signed an agreement to work together on finding a construction base. Watching on was Dorothy Mather, the widow of Arthur Peppercorn. The spirit of the project is in Doncaster. It built the finest locomotives, and we've certainly found from the council and many people who've worked at the plant um, an enormous amount of enthusiasm uh, for this project. Dorothy was on hand a few months later to formally begin construction as the frames for the new A1 were cut, something her husband might never have imagined. He would have been absolutely delighted, and I'm so pleased that I'm here to represent him. But while the work was going on in Leeds, the Trust were no nearer to finding a home in Doncaster. We were at a point where we'd had the mainframes uh, rolled at Scunthorpe, and sitting on the back of a wagon when we went into the old Doncaster works as was, because we were going to have the mainframes profiled on the machine there that had been used since steam days. And uh, we were told that they just scrapped it the previous day and that morning it had gone out on the back of a wagon in pieces. So that was pretty much a uh, Doncaster finish for us because there was no permanent home had been found for us. The machine that we thought was going to profile our mainframes had just been scrapped. At the start of 1995, a meeting was held with the council. Time was of the essence. Our prime consideration is to have the locomotive built and running in 1998. Uh, and in order to achieve that, we have to keep construction to a fairly uh, tight timetable. Um, now, at the moment, we've no reason to believe other than the fact that the locomotive will be constructed in Doncaster. But we have to be mindful of the timetable, uh, and unless a suitable site can be found in the time scale, then obviously we would have to look elsewhere. But the very next day, the 5th of January 1995, the trustees and covenanters of the project were headed south to see progress on their locomotive. The newly cut frames were being erected at Tisley Locomotive Works, home of the Birmingham Railway Museum. So it is very important that we maintain this fundraising to keep the momentum going. 
If we do this, and if we can continue to grow the funds and the contributions at the rate we've achieved so far, I am confident that this locomotive will be finished by our target date of 1998. A bottle of real ale was smashed over the front buffer beam to celebrate the birth of the A1. And it was time to announce another important decision. One of the early sponsors to come along was a publishing house. I mean, they asked if uh, the engine could bear the name of the publishing house. We said, OK, if you're, you know, if you're going to give us money. And then after a little while, he called us up. He says, well, we think it's such a worthwhile project. He says, you know, we're not really bothered about having our name on the, on the engine, but but then we're in the middle of the uh, first uh, Gulf War. And he says, you know, don't you think it would be appropriate to have a, a name uh, that's redolent of the times and bearing in mind what's, what the RAF are doing, why don't you call it Tornado? I thought, well, that's a brilliant idea because it's got so many meanings. It's a wonderful name for a fast locomotive. It just conjures up uh, an image of power. <laughs> In the company of another Doncaster export, Flying Scotsman, representatives of the RAF handed over two nameplates for the project. One bearing the crest of the largest tornado base, RAF Cottesmore, the other the insignia of the Tornado Training Centre. Over the next few months, the frames rapidly took shape under the expert guidance of the engineers at Tysley. Tarsley had been very good to us because when Doncaster f fell through, they'd taken the frames down to Birmingham and had uh, the work on the main frames d d done. But it had to be an appropriate place for the main part of the engine to be built. Well, the only other really appropriate place was Darlington. Turning their sights north, the Trust quickly came across the derelict Hope Town Works in Darlington. Within weeks, the local council were handing over the keys to the delight of Dorothy Mather. One thing I'm so proud of is the fact that they're doing something about my late husband, and I think it's actually, I'm so delighted about it. Within a very short space of time, we found ourselves actually with the new Darlington Locomotive Works. The building was a survivor of the earliest days of the railways, having been used to build carriages for the Stockton and Darlington Company. The A1 Trust had their home, but it would need a complete restoration. This project will give a, a tremendous boost uh, to the borough, and based as it is on our history, uh, the history of the borough, which is the birthplace of the railways, it makes it particularly appropriate. Darlington Council, from the moment that they were approached, couldn't do more to actually attract the project to the town. The council helped the trust secure £300,000 of grant funds to renovate the works. While that went ahead, back at Tysley, the frames of Tornado continued to take shape. Other components were arriving too. Having persuaded a pattern maker out of retirement, the three cylinders for the locomotive were cast, including the three-ton inside cylinder. But progress was slower than hoped. What we hadn't got to at that stage was to reach a critical mass in terms of having the finances available to build things any faster. But what we've always shown over the years is that progress generated more interest, more interest generated more money, more money generated more progress, and therefore it got, you got into a virtuous circle. But it was a matter of how fast can you get that virtuous circle to turn. The Trust did score some more valuable publicity in 1997, when the frames were placed on display. Visitors to the Great Hall of the National Railway Museum, admiring some of the oldest steam locomotives in the world, were able to see the newest one taking shape. It had already been admitted by this point that there was no prospect of meeting the 1998 steaming date, the 30th anniversary of the end of steam on the main line. But at least the Trust were able to move into their new Darlington shed. We thought, well, you only get one chance to open a, a locomotive work, so I borrowed some theatrical curtains from Darlington Civic Theatre, uh, mounted a curtain around the engine, uh, borrowed the smoke machine from the disco, <laughs> placed it in the pit. And I 
Dirt, uh, Dorothy, Arthur uh, Pettigrew's widow, uh, to welcome Tornado to her new home. At that point, we started playing L Land of Hope and Glory. <laughs> the smoke started in the pit, and the curtain slowly came up. <laughs> Terrific fun. <laughs> Tornado was more recognisable than ever, even sporting the outline of a cab, with the ceremony designed to generate headlines. Well, it had to have, because when we started off, we had a single sheet, A4 sheet of paper. Um, you, you know, you, you had to do things in a way that attracted attention. It was as simple as that. A weekend of celebration concluded with possibly the very first black tie reception inside a locomotive shed. The trust were on a roll with more Covenanters signing up to support Tornado financially. It was going terrifically well. Uh, as more and more was constructed, uh, it had a frisson uh, about it. And the people who were involved giving us money had a very special esprit de corps, which we quite deliberately fostered. And because there were special people, without them we had nothing. With the wheels already ordered, the first components for the three sets of motion were forged in Bury. This project, whilst an engineering challenge, is principally a project management challenge. We've had to ensure that we bring these components together and that we've specified to the various manufacturers in sufficient detail that when the components do come together, they do fit. We've assembled the locomotive in, in Darlington. We've actually had components for the locomotive built not only throughout the UK, but also across the world from South Africa, even from Australia, where, where components have come in from. And it's been finding those cottage industries that could do things, or finding those modern industrial organisations which still do a similar process that we need today. By the turn of the millennium, the project was under new leadership. David Champion had retired as chairman to care for his terminally ill wife. Mark Allett was the new chairman who would take the project forward. It's been industrial archaeology. We've had to go and discover how things were done. And in the old locomotive works, um, the ways in which processes were carried out were handed over between father and son, between people on the workshop floor, often not even in communication with the drawing office. And so when you get the drawings to actually build something from, A, they're sometimes wrong, and B, they've not got any instructions like an airfix kit. You actually also have to discover, again, how did you put this together? Soon afterwards, the engineering team had the locomotive on its wheels and looking more complete than ever. So, I think nothing to do but to ask um, Ian if he'd like to uh, move the locomotive. But the biggest challenge was yet to come. No one had constructed a brand new boiler of the required size for decades, and the price tag was estimated at a quarter of a million pounds. We spent three years looking for somebody to manufacture our boiler. The requirements were stringent. If we were going to seek sponsorship from industry, we were going to have to use a modern method of assembly. And all commercial boilers today are welded together and almost invariably out of, completely out of steel. So we made the decision that we were going to have an all-steel boiler that was welded together, at which point we approached in excess of 12 companies in the UK, of which most of them said they were basically unable to help us. But a total of three took some level of interest. Whoever manufactured the boiler, there would be tight regulations to adhere to. But they were vital if Tornado was to be approved to operate on the main line. One by one, the UK options dried up. We'd come to this impasse in the UK. We spread the net wider into Europe and we looked at Poland, briefly at Holland, the Czech Republic and East, the former East Germany. And out of these people we looked at, the mining and works in East Germany came out as head and shoulders above everybody else. While work continued on the lower half of Tornado, contract negotiations began in earnest with the Germans. In the first departure from the tried and tested Covenanter system for raising money, the Trust arranged a special bond issue to pay for the boiler work, ensuring a lump sum was available to accelerate progress. Meanwhile, the continuing Covenant funding would be needed to pay for the ongoing work in Darlington, some of which was a specialised departure from steam age practice. 
Liquid nitrogen was used to shrink fit the locomotive's cylinder valve liners into place. Check the alignment. Excellent. Happy? Yeah, ecstatic. It's relearning lost skills from the past, plus application of as much new technology as we realistically can, where it saves money and makes the whole process safer and simpler. Machined motion components were arriving at the works, further encouraging take-up of the boiler bond issue. In late October 2005, the order was given to the Germans to start cutting metal. Meinigen itself looks like it was created for a children's story. An even stranger place then for a sprawling locomotive works, which themselves belong to another age. Meiningen had designed this, all we did was set, let set down a specification yes. was that it had to fit into the envelope yes. of the original boiler. Yeah. But otherwise it is entirely designed by Meiningen. Because Meiningen were operating steam, well, East Germany was operating steam till 1988, yes. the regulations in this country have kept up with welding and other techniques, yeah. whereas the regulations in the UK as far as steam locomotives stopped in 1970. There's yeah. been nothing more recent since then. Uh, and consequently, the metal specifications, the weld specifications are instantly recognisable in DIN and EN specifications mm. in this country, which are now recognised throughout Europe. The 20-tonne boiler took several months to build. The Germans saw the A1 project as a way of proving their credentials to the UK steam market. We also had to reduce the height of the boiler slightly to fit within the modern uh, requirements on network rail. And so that meant we had to redesign the boiler. And what we then had to therefore do was find an organisation that could do design work on boilers and could manufacture them. And we also, what we didn't want to find is that we were drip feeding cash into a small cottage industry that might then not survive us drip feeding that cash in. And we ended up with a half complete boiler um, after, after spending several hundred thousand pounds on it. Quite excited, not just about the boiler, the whole, the whole setup is 50 years behind the times in some ways. Um, but in other ways, they've, they've spent a lot of money in the last 10 years and I can see how they've established what really is a superb locomotive repair facility. Is superheated steam, does that increase the volume of the steam? Yeah, and it increases, increases the thermal content yeah, yeah, of the steam. It's drier, um, isn't it, as well? It's drier, yeah, it, yeah. It, it has several advantages. So it raises, as it soon, raises the pressure? Uh, no, it raises the energy content. Right. As soon as steam enters the cylinder, it expands as, as soon as you've, you've yeah, cut off yeah, the steam yeah. it starts expanding and using the the energy in the steam in it, yeah. the trouble is once it starts to expand it starts to condense as well yeah. which of course cools the cylinder down so you want to keep the cylinder as hot as possible mm -hmm. so the, the the act of superheating does two things it puts more energy into the steam to begin with yeah. and it also means that the steam won't condense immediately it starts to expand on the test rig for running in. We chose Meiningen for the air pumps because, as well as coming up with a reasonable price, they were able to offer a fully overhauled air pump, run in, set up and calibrated before it arrived in the UK. The second pump is scheduled to be delivered in October, by which time we hope to have the bracketry all in place to mount them permanently and to be able to continue with the plumbing. Um, but as I'm sure as you're well aware, this all depends on money, so if anybody is feeling generous after this uh, visit, we would appreciate further contributions to the funds, as there's still a lot of metal work to go between the frames before we can lower the boiler onto the engine. I was sad in a way because we had started out by promoting the A1 as being the best of British engineering, and obviously as soon as we go abroad, it's not all British. But I think in, the, in hindsight, there is nowhere in the UK anything like Meiningen. And what Meiningen did above all else is, is give us a product which 
satisfied and created confidence amongst the various certification agencies, Her Majesty's Railway Inspectorate, Network Rail and all the other bodies we have to convince before we can operate our locomotive on the main line. In mid-July 2006, the boiler was delivered from Germany. Lifting it into the Darlington Works was a major physical and psychological step forward for the Trust. I think that people had different levels of scepticism. Depending on what was there in their mind was the thing that would stop the, the project being complete, um, was the thing that then they sort of ticked that box. And of course they were the ones who were never going to put their hands in the pocket, so always had the next excuse not to do it. I think it was things like the wheels being cast, the boiler being ordered, and I think the boiler being delivered really was the, the final, um, the final, there is no excuse after that. And anyone who wasn't backing the project because they didn't believe it would happen at that stage quite simply was mean. The 50th A1 was no longer a question of if, but when. Dorothy Mather would see her husband's legacy live again. While the Germans had been hard at work, the Trust's contractors and volunteers had been far from idle. But before the boiler could take its place as Tornado's beating heart, there was a lot of work to do between the frames. We're at the stage now where we have lots and lots of small steps happening. We've, we've done all the big bits, the wheels, the cylinders, the smoke box, uh, all the, the impressive bits, even things like the cab, which is not very uh, special, but it, it, it's pe something that people recognise. And we've now got lots and lots of bits like this. Ian Howitt was by now a regular fixture in Darlington. This is the valve spindle crosshead. We are going to pour this white metal, which is a um, molten mixture of tin and lead, about 250 degrees C. This is a routine process that was done every day in, in any big running shed in the country. This is extremely old technology. We have a new bit of technology, which is a laser um, infrared thermometer, which tells us what temperature it is. Personally, I prefer the piece of solder, which we just touch on to the job, and when it's up to temperature, the solder melts. We're not far off. We're at the stage now where we do all these bits and the engine doesn't actually look any different. Um, putting the wheels under takes a day and everybody comes along and says, oh, you've done something. I mean, we put the handrail knobs on a couple of weeks ago and, and the handrails, which took all of half a day. Um, and at the convention last week, um, it was probably the most talked about bit. That, oh, you put the handrails on. <laughs> you know, it, it's a you know, hundred pound job and, and half, a, half a day to do it. But, um, this obviously is a lot more than £100, it, it's, the white metal is fairly expensive, the tinning compound, uh, which is a mixture of pure tin, this stuff, that's, that's 80 odd pounds for a, a bottle of that, uh, that'll probably do us four or five years. Okay Pete, I think you can turn the torch off. The tech is not very high on this I fear. I just think the danger of burning one's pinkies here. The trouble is, you know, sooner get one fixed than a, another one starts. Bother. What we're trying to do now, we want to cool at the bottom so that while the top is still liquid, so it feeds down uh, as it cools, because it will contract. So we'll start cooling it with, with rags. If it contracts from the bottom upwards, it will then leave us cavities. So we, we will keep the top warm. I'll melt a bit more white metal on. Sorry, the screw drive was a bit damp. It, it's very much a budget type process because we're only doing three. 
we were building a batch of 50 and we'd have 150 of these to do, we'd probably spend a week on making the sophisticated fixture up. We spent about half a day making that up. I think the thing is that we're interested in engineering rather than steam engines. I mean, I could be quite happily doing this for a, for a, you know, for a ship or for a marine diesel or um, a tram or, or, or something, all of which use the same sort of technology. Um, I like steam engines, I like, like railways, but my principal um, interest is the engineering. I have no ambition to drive a train particularly. It's fun to have a little squirt, but to be a driver is not something that particularly excites me. It's, it's the manufacturing, it's the making of them and the maintenance that, that I enjoy. Another year slips past. Another crane comes to Darlington. And once again, the boiler is up in the air. How much you got your side on the car taxi? Well, let's use it, because it makes it easier. Graham Bunker has joined the Trust as Operations Director. That'll do. Bloody hell. We're just going to roll on the other side, mate. Just uh, keep control of it, yeah? Today's the moment when the boiler will finally be united with the rest of the locomotive. So, chaps, it can't be done. And the pressure is on for the Trust and the Germans. You've got a pull, as you said, you've got a pull inside out. Yeah, it's going to come over the way. Hey, you're not going to push it because the brain's trying to put it back. We issued the Germans with a 36-line interface specification. That is 36 places where things touch, bolt onto the boiler, or are attached to the boiler in some way, which had to be in the right place and accurate to the extent that when the boiler is fitted to the locomotive and the smoke box is fitted to the boiler, they actually went together. About six inches, well, a bit more. The lift takes most of the morning, and fortunately, everything fits first time. Well, a little bit more, Pete. As one of our guys said, we managed to get the boiler onto the locomotive without having to resort to an angle grinder once. And that is a great tribute to the accuracy the Germans managed to build into it. And it also shows the importance, the thoroughness we went into in specifying this boiler to the Germans. But when the trust tried to put Tornado back into the shed, the day starts to get really interesting. We did have a, a slight problem that uh, we rolled the locomotive frame out onto some temporary track outside, which had been in situ for about 10 years. In fact, it was the same track we used to roll the frames in back in 1997. And uh, it was fine with the, the frames resting on the, at the track, but by placing the boiler on the frames, we effectively doubled the weight of the assembly. And the rather old sleepers underneath this track started to compress somewhat to the extent that uh, we found we were faced with three-eighths of an inch high step to get the locomotive over to get it back into the workshop. Almost. That's it. By this time, it's weighing about 70 tonnes and in the end it involved a considerable amount of effort using um, uh, pullers, turfers, uh, the forklift truck and as many people as we could assemble leaning on it to actually get it to go up this step. But once the A1 is safely inside, suddenly the Hopetown Lane shed is much more deserving of the title Locomotive Works. What we can see behind us now is what starts to look like a finished locomotive. It really is lots of detail work from now on. There's a lot of work to do, but it's detail work. And what you can see there is recognisably an A1, for the first time since the last one was scrapped in 1966. The thing that really took an awful lot of time and a huge number of man hours was the pipe work and to a lesser extent the electrics work, which could only be done after the boiler had been put on. And to put this into context, we've put 3.5 kilometres of cable into the locomotive and somewhere in the region of £12,000 worth of copper pipe uh, and many hundreds of fittings, a lot of which have had to be made specially. You notice the bright shiny bits in the cab, but if you go under the frame, it is a mass of complex and expensive plumbing. We've also got first, the first of the turbo generator connectors. Mm -hmm. That is the step ring joint for the steam pipe on the turbo gen. But while the engineers steadily worked through the plans, there was still one more major part of the project 
which had barely seen any progress at all, the tender. Ironically, this had been one of the elements first considered in the early 1990s. A water carrier, which once ran as a second tender behind Flying Scotsman, was located and purchased. Totally derelict, the tank was scrapped, but the frames were salvageable and work began to restore them. However, the Trust were already considering roller bearings. The old frames would need substantial alterations as a result. So the decision was made to sell them and build from new after all. The contract for the new frames was awarded to Ian Howitt, working from his base at Wakefield. They were 20, 20 feet long and about three foot deep. Uh, and they are flame cut basically to the shape. We machined the top edge and the two ends so they were square and we had a datum to work to. Uh, and then we assembled them on a, on a machine bed plate upside down using that top edge as a datum. Um, and then uh, just, just fitted all the small bits, the horn blocks, the spring brackets, the tank brackets. The decision was taken that they wanted fitted bolts. Actually, they, technically they were driven bolts rather than fitted bolts, where the bolt is two or three thousand bigger than the hull, and you, you drive it in so it gives a, a, a snug fit. So e even if the nut comes loose, the bolt won't fall out and the, and, and the piece won't move. As I say, we built the thing upside down um, so that we worked off the datum. Uh, and then, obviously, we had to put them the right way up at some stage. Now to you again. The reason we did it at that stage was because the tank was being made by somebody else in Darlington. Uh, and the tank is held to the frames with some, something approaching 100 nuts and bolts. Uh, now, the chances of, of actually marking off and drilling a hundred holes and getting them all to line up was, was pretty slim. So what we said we'd do is we'd turn the, the frames over and we'd get the, the tank bottom, bring it here, and we would drill the holes between the frames and the tank bottom so that everyone lined up. The tender tank itself was being built a stone's throw from Tornado's shed in Darlington by Northview Engineering. It too needed a redesign from Peppercorn's original plans. Coal capacity was traded off to allow an extra 1,000 gallons of water to be carried, improving the locomotive's range between stops. It's been ongoing for about 12 months plus. It took the men quite a while and there's a lot of awkward pieces to put together on it. It's very time consuming and uh, it's difficult to, in some respects to get, yeah, get what the customer actually wants because these things have never been built for years. It's been an interesting job because this one's been redesigned with uh, welded construction with ribs inside to achieve the same strength with a high water capacity. So it's uh, been really technical and also to keep the straightness of the tender with the welding and that and the flatness and all these extra ribs in, it has been a, a technical challenge which we've overcome. With, with us being uh, sort of, if you like, a bespoke engineering company where we do a lot of bespoke items, so to, to be involved in, in building something like that's very interesting, you know, along the way. Work on parts of the tender wasn't just going on around the country. The wheel sets were assembled in Lancashire using axles from Rotherham, wheels cast in Sheffield and tyres shipped in from South Africa. By late November 2007, it was time for the tender to start to come together. A job like that, they, they, they fitted, there was no problem because there, there's about 20, 25 thou clearance between the axle boxes and the, um, the horns. But the problem is with a, with a big three-dimensional thing, uh, 20, 20 or 30 thou is not a lot of clearance, so there's a certain amount of jiggling about because, of course, you don't get the frames hung on, uh, slung on the crane dead, dead level. Now you're on perfect this side. Yeah, moderate yeah, technical yeah. adjustment. The axles are not perhaps dead square across the track, so there's a bit of jiggling about, but we knew full well that they would fit yeah. because we had actually tried each axle box in the, uh, in the hornways before, before it left here. Well, something went. I've got a feeling we might still have to chock and get that round the other side yeah. of there. You know it's going to do it. And, uh, if worse comes to the worst, you, you've got an angle grinder and you just grind a little bit more clearance. It takes most of an afternoon, 
but eventually the frames and the wheels come together perfectly and finally take their place in the shed behind the locomotive. Right to the bit of wood. All right, yeah, that's it, lovely. <laughs> With the last piece of the jigsaw taking shape, there was plenty for the A1 Trust's Covenanters to discuss at their annual convention. I think they come from all walks of life. I mean, there are a variety of things that motivate people to um, give money to the project. Some people do it because they actually remember A1s the first time round and were quite passionate about them. They have that sense of that sense of loss with them having uh, been scrapped so early in their careers. There are others like myself who happen to be just fans of, of, of LNER locomotives and are, are too young to have seen them. For others, it's the actual challenge of doing it, and they're not even particularly interested in the LNER, but they're interested in the idea of resurrecting skills or just the, the as I said, the intellectual challenge of, of building something from scratch. Welcome to what is going to be our last convention before Tornado Steams. What a fantastic situation to be in. We've had um, a convention, not an annual general meeting, but a convention every year. And the idea of that is with the trustees presenting back to their stakeholders exactly what they had been doing with their money throughout the year. Has any decisions yet been taken on the form the water carrying vehicle might take? I think in terms of the decision what form will it take, it's probably actually say what form won't it take. What we do know from working with Network Rail is that if we wanted to run at 90 mile an hour with two tenders, they won't let us. We have a few ideas which are being progressed, and it has to be said, most efforts are being directed towards finishing the loco for obvious reasons. What's amazed me, in fact, is how, even though we get a lot of people along at our events, is how many people have actually, they've contributed for years and have actually never seen the locomotive. <laughs> at a recent event, I was talking to one chap who he'd actually got involved before I did, and it was the first time he'd seen the locomotive. And he'd been giving the project money for 17 years. Yeah, they still have a fair bit of work to do, haven't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's quite, yeah, it's got, uh, the brake puller. Yeah. We've got middle cylinder and the outside cylinders connected at the moment. Oh, have, no right? piston ring in, right. no rings in, but you can turn this by hand when you lift this locomotive really? with all the rods there. You turn it by hand? By hand. Unbelievable, isn't yeah. it? Right? I've seen it from nothing to how it is today, and it is absolutely, you know, first class. Well, I've been coming for 10 years, so I've been covenanting for, for 10 years, and, you know, really excited about, about it, really. I mean, what you see today is more than I've seen before by a long shot. The fact they've actually managed to hold it together and really get it off the ground, and, I mean, it's proof today when you look at the size of it and everything that's gone together, the boiler being there, the cladding on and all that, and you think, yes, this is going to work and this is going to be brilliant. I mean, there's a lot of people say, you'll never do it. Yeah. Well, but there's always doubting, Tom. There it is, yes. <laughs> Say cheese, everybody! And determined to give the locomotive a test steaming before the end of 2007, work steps up a gear at Darlington. In the end, the deadline is missed by only a few days. There we go. Trying to bit chill. No, that's it. In early January 2008, I'm fine now, no, it's, uh... Dorothy Mather, now in her 90s, lights Tornado's first fire. I'm just, you know, choked. Absolutely choked. It's just, uh, she's alive now. Two days to hit her through gently. Um, just get, because it's first fire, be really gentle, go to warm up slowly, and then take her up to full pressure on Friday. And that's and then, the real moment. And that's the real moment when those safety valves lift for the first time. Yeah. That's it. When the safety valves first lifted, it was a, it was the usual sense of relief and uh, and real sort of emotion with the thing. I, I don't go emotional very often, but uh, it was one of those occasions when I had the hair standing up on the back of my neck. I'm just looking at the external side of the boiler now on the throat plate here, just making sure there's any there's any leaks which are going to be detrimental to the working of the boiler. The stays seem nice and dry and the seams and everything. You're basically checking the boiler in its own right up to its maximum working pressure, making sure its safety valves work, making sure there's no leaks anywhere. Uh, and 
This was done out of doors, the first time the whole locomotive had been out of doors for any length of time, and it went remarkably well. It was not surprising that it didn't leak. But the man who needs to be convinced is the independent boiler inspector, John Glaze. This is streets ahead compared to uh, a heritage locomotive and it's all flanged and riveted steel and copper construction and you always get weeps and dribbles on the old boilers but on this we don't have anything. It's absolutely bone dry, even all the fittings are nice and dry. When I first read it in the steam magazines I thought it was a little bit of a steam puffer's dream, you know. Never thought it would really come to actual fruition. But obviously when the frames were first cut and the wheels were done and it started to grow, then, you know, people in the, the railway preservation movement could see that this has to be took seriously. What was really satisfying was even in this unkempt, un unclad condition, how well the boiler steamed and how well it, it boiled water. In fact, so much so that our 800-gallon water tank, which we had uh, connected up for the purposes of keeping the boiler full of water once we started generating steam, emptied very rapidly, uh, and we had to ask the fire brigade to come in and provide enough water to finish the tests. They were very cooperative and helped and were rather, rather bemused by what we were doing there. But what it did demonstrate was that we had a boiler with a serious boil water boiling capability, which of course with a big engine with the size of this is what you're looking for. Well, I didn't think it was going to be this size. I'd seen them doing some work, obviously, with uh, being in the area. But uh, I was expecting Loco or one to tell you the truth, not uh, some of the size of the Mallard. With the test successfully completed, all that remained was the signing of the paperwork an essential requirement for the locomotive to go on to run on heritage railways and out on the main line. There we go. Thank you, John. Thanks for that. Cheers. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Just, just Whoa. But there was still time for some Anglo-German celebrations, with the Trust and the men from Meinigen sharing a toast. 60 years after the first A1 had been completed, the 50th was on the home straight. Tornado! Tornado! A month later, and the tender tank is ready for delivery from Northview Engineering. With the base already checked against Ian Howitt's frames, this last big lift is straightforward. David Elliott did send me a, an email when they'd put the tank on saying that all the bolts had gone in successfully. So he, he was uh, quite pleased and obviously we were, that you know, uh, the job had gone quite well. After a trial fit, the tank was lifted back up to rest on wooden blocks so the remaining work on the tender frames could be completed. With a month of the 10-year boiler certificate already elapsed, it was more important than ever that the project was finished. There were no springs on the locomotive, there were no brakes, there was no sanding gear, there were, there were no electrics, there was hardly any of the plumbing. There was just enough to conduct the steam test. Uh, we really were tearing through money because it, sometimes we had 12, 13 people working in there, of which there'd be two or three volunteers, but the rest are paid contractors. Again, it was, a lot of it was continuing this plumbing work, uh, refitting all the cladding, insulating the boiler, large amount of work finishing off bronze fittings of which they abound all over the locomotive and they're all special to the to locomotives. We were spending somewhere between um, 60 and 70 thousand pounds a month on the project every month. And if you look back at what that is over the years of the project that's the amount 10 years ago more than the amount we would have spending in a year. One thing that also surprised us, um, or certainly surprised me, was the time and cost of getting the thing painted. We are starting with bare metal all the time. In some cases, bare metal which has got scale on it because it's gone through a rolling mill. And to get the paint to it here, you end up having to either do a very lengthy hand rub down process or if we possibly can, we sandblast it to get it back to bare metal. Uh, but this process uh, did take us quite a bit longer and cost more than we were anticipating. And there was this great pressure just to get it finished. Thankfully, um, an awful lot of people put their hand in the pocket over that time, um, either with small amounts or significantly a small number of individuals writing very large cheques for us. I just got your, yeah, your stats and statistics you need on the locomotive. 
at the cost is in excess of three million pounds. About 175,000 man hours. With Tornado's debut in sight, the press are also interested. Just over 6,000 uh, gallons of water. And that will give us a range of around 150 miles or so. And for the trustees, there are stakeholders to manage as well. When it's ready, the A1 will spend some time running in at the Great Central Railway and then move to the National Railway Museum for mainline trials and painting. 80 mile an hour, York, Newcastle, as long as nothing fell off 85 But first, a schedule of dates has to be agreed by everyone. Talk about coming off, off the GC, it's probably the point to yeah. start, because that's when it starts to hit an I impact. Say, yeah. I think what we need is what you've given us already, which is to say a schedule of dates um, uh, linked with a uh, understanding of what's happening between yeah. those dates. So, so you know my recollection got is that as it stands, we've got mm. a bit of paper which says something like the th end of June, towards the end of June. We haven't even told our own funders that that date has moved mm -hmm. for the simple reason that Graham and the team didn't do a full project review until the Wednesday this week. So it's a, this is this is you know we've got that done for this meeting mm -hmm. so we can go through the dates. It comes off the GC around the 21st um, of July, give or take where it goes to Derby, gets reweighed at Derby, um, obviously having been on a low loader, yeah. um, and then runs up from Derby to York as its light engine test run on what, if my memory is correct, is the 28th of July. But it's the 29th of July before Tornado is even ready to move, to the surprise of some. I wonder what some of our neighbours in Darlington actually thought was going on in that shed. Um, I mean, it was even funnier when we actually moved it for, for the first time, because there was someone who was local popped out and said, when did it arrive? And I, and I said, well, actually, it was 1997 we started building it in this shed, and it's been in there all the time. And they're, oh, OK, and wandered off. When you finish this little job, could you do me the honour of deburring these items so that we can get them painted? Of course. They're the little ledges that the window frames sit on. I think there was a lot of expectation and, and is it actually going to work and after you know sort of 17 years of, uh, of, of us being there doing actually with the project you're thinking well you know this is the, this is the moment of truth will it actually work and um, yeah we were nervous. As the boiler pressure was slowly raised Graham Bunker took his place in the driver's seat. David we ain't going anywhere yet there's a load of hammers and spanners all on the full plate at his side. I did ask him to tidy up. Meanwhile, David also has the track to attend to. Well, our new track work is still very new and we don't have any proper point uh, linkage or controls for it, so we are doing a process known as clipping and padlocking and this is a special device which is effectively a G-clamp designed to fit and um, we put a padlock on to stop anybody inadvertently moving them while we're, not, while we're moving up and down. There's time for some last minute preparations as the clock ticks towards 12, the moment the trust have chosen for Tornado to make its first moves for a strictly invited audience. The most um, heart stopping and at the same time pulse racing time, if that's not a contradiction in terms, was the time when our operations director wound the engine into reverse outside our works opened the cylinder drain cocks, pulled the regulator handle. Oh, here goes nothing anyway. Yes! yes. yes. <laughs> well done, David. And it goes backwards. Yes. yes. Well, over this next bit, please. And it just moved off silently, apart from the whoosh of steam. No clunks and bangs, no funny wheezing noises. It moved, and what's more important, the brake stopped it as well. Yes! Magic! <laughs> It works. Now we need to see if it goes the other way. Yeah, that's all right, yeah. No, that's okay, then, no, yeah, we no, aren't no. going to win much going backwards.
absolutely marvellous. It's uh, unbelievable, I didn't think it would be possible. I'm drained physically, and it's making me feel drained emotionally, really. Just accumulation of all that hard craft by all these lads. But in practice, the only problems we've had to deal with since the locomotive has gone into traffic are related to things like air brakes and electrics and this sort of thing, which we knew we were going to have simply because we hadn't finished all these systems off. But the basic steam circuit has worked perfectly. In a traditional celebration, commemorative coins were placed on the track for the engine to run over. Where's the uh, writing gone on it? One of the things I'm really, really um, focused on is involving as many younger people in the project as we can. Now all you have to do is find the other two. I wasn't um, as welcomed as I might have been to other projects as somebody in their, 19, in, in their 20s wanting to be involved in something. And, um, and yet you've got a child who looks there in wonder at it. You think, well, this is a locomotive that's going to be around for way beyond when I'm gone. And we've got to have a younger generation who's going to take on the mantle and actually keep this locomotive going. They're being a little bit louder. We've got a few more testing trials to do here. It's the first mainline engine to be built in this country for 50 years. Two days later, and the private performance has become a public spectacle as the country's brand new mainline steam engine steps into the limelight. For those who've dedicated years to the project, it's a moment of vindication. A long time to do it, but you know, it's uh, well worth waiting for. Tornado makes a number of runs up and down the short track for the media, with the resulting pictures screened across the country and later around the world. Dorothy Mather is on the footplate as the guest of honour. It's the moment a new steam legend is born. But legends need to prove themselves. The A1 is loaded onto a lorry and taken down its tarmac namesake to the Great Central Railway in Leicestershire for some high-speed testing and trials. For the first time in more than a decade, the works in Darlington lay empty. For the Trust, it's time to switch from construction to operation. Having satisfied the authorities, first running light engine and then at speed with ever increasing loads behind it, Tornado is settling into a railway environment. Today it's being prepared for a very special occasion, its first passenger trains. There's even time in the cab to record the moment. Then it's time for departure and picking up guests. And the people who've paid for the locomotive to be built are the first in line for a ticket to ride. Naturally enough, the brand new Peppercorn A1 is the focus of attention all day. And 18 years after the business plan was sketched out on a sheet of A4, there's time for David Champion to reacquaint himself with the locomotive. Can you get on? 
Yeah. It grabs the rest of my passengers. Yeah. Oh, right, so they got separated from you. See you that? This train 1155 service, Tornado Special, all aboard, please. All aboard. wonderful to have people who we've seen right from the very beginning of the project. People have flown in from Australia, flown in from Canada, travel from across the UK just to be here today and that's just, you know, just awesome. Well, it's exciting to be able to come on it. I saw, first saw Tornado when it was in bit, uh, first being built two years ago up at Darlington and got so impressed the fact that they've gone to trouble to build a completely new locomotive. When I knew it was going to run, I had to come today and have a ride behind it. There's, there's everything, there's the smell and there's the sound and I think it's just fantastic the achievement that, that they've done. Absolutely brilliant. I never ever thought I'd get to this, we never thought we'd get to this day. We're just it's so excited, aren't we, the pair of us, so wonderful. During the day, Tornado carries more than a thousand Covenanters, sponsors and guests of the Trust. Four faultless return trips and 64 miles later, the hard work seems worth it. Well, it's a mixture of elation and relief. Uh, it is good that the engine has performed immaculately since it arrived here in Loughborough and is continuing to do so today. And in particular for this year, the weather has smiled upon us and it's, it's just a sea of happy faces and people shaking my hand and thanking me and I really am pleased and very satisfied with the way it's gone. The best thing about it for me is that uh, we've now done, what, four and a half, four and a bit round trips and I haven't had a single agitated phone call from a foot plate yet, no, so it means no. it's working. Oh, very well. After two months at the Great Central, Tornado is being prepared to move on to the National Railway Museum. We're actually using port paraffin and port oil. I mean, it keeps things from going rusty, even though we're cleaning it with a paraffin. It is the best mix for on the wheels and anything below the, that level there. Otherwise, I mean, it's like a polished job above the top. Peter Neeson has taken on responsibility for day-to-day -day operations. Made a lot of friends down here. Uh, we've had a lot of help and we've had a, it's been really brilliant. We have just been tested, but uh, she was built for a lot more than what we can give her here, if you understand what I mean. We've done load testing, passed everything we wanted off that. Uh, we've done speed trials up to 60 mile an hour. She's done that without, a, you know, taking it in a stride. Now it's, the next development is to go mainline. The promise of the project has begun to pay off in style, but the trusts still have one more part of the plan to fulfil, to run on the main line. November 2008. Having completed two earlier test runs on the national network, Tornado now faces a stiffer challenge. A full 75 mile an hour dash between York and Newcastle on the East Coast Main Line. This evening's run is to uh, prove that the engine is uh, fit for service. We've already done most of the dynamic tests, but this is an opportunity to prove that the engine is uh, fit to haul trains over many miles at its design speed. We're just looking for that the engine performs well, uh, on a constant demand of sort of an hour or 20 minutes or so and that uh, nothing uh, runs warm and everything is uh, as should be expected. More than ever, the pre-run checks are carried out meticulously. Just put the atomizer on and just this feeds our steam oil into the cylinders. It's pretty important, you lose your lubrication in your cylinders, your valves and your cylinders. Uh, your piston rings could actually start to seize and the valves could actually start to seize.
this is the last big test for the locomotive. If everything goes well, the last bits of paperwork needed for Tornado to regularly operate on the main line will be forthcoming. In return for sponsoring the test run, the Trust have even changed the tender decoration from their own web address to the National Express logo. But the locomotive will be heading out onto the main line while other trains are still running. It will need to run problem-free so there are no delays to any of the company's passenger trains. Causing heads to turn, Tornado rolls into York Station on time and ready to go. A few VIPs have been invited on board, and some are keen to measure every moment of the run. For the thousands at the line side, it's nothing short of spectacular. Others on board are conducting tests to make sure Tornado really does meet the high standards demanded from it. We have a GPS antenna on the roof which is measuring um, the speed of the train and the location of the train. And when we come to do a brake application, we can integrate the velocity to get the distance. So it's part of the process which, uh, whereby we have to comply with brake stopping distances. When I press this button right here, what it will do is it will start recording data from when I press the button all the way until the train comes to a stop. From there it measures the acceleration, from there it calculates backwards to find it just at how fast we were going when I press the button and the total braking distance. Of course what we're interested here in is the braking distance as uh, Jim mentioned earlier which we are going to use to determine to see if the train complies with our safety standards. And some have a more sentimental reason to enjoy a 75 mile an hour cruise behind 60163. It's just a hobby, I suppose. It's a bigger aspect of rail enthusiasm that I've been keen on uh, most of my life. And uh, I've got some copious uh, records of previous runs on this line with A1 engines like this one. And it's useful for comparison. As the train sprints past Darlington, Tornado's footplate crew are happy to remind people the locomotive is briefly passing its home. The load we've got on today is, is, is bigger than the standard loads that used to be pulled around by these engines and we're doing uh, the sort of speed which uh, they used to do regularly. North of Durham, and after a scheduled emergency stop, the new machine is drawing very favourable comparisons with the rest of the class. It's genuine in the 50th A1. It's um, so little different to see from outside that uh, there's, there's no seam between them. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's wonderful to see it. The run between York and Newcastle is a replay of the special rail tour in the 60s which brought the curtain down on steam on the East Coast Main Line. At least some of the landmarks would be familiar to anyone who was on that train. But rarely can Newcastle Central have been so busy after nine o'clock, 
with the platform ends heaving with people. I must admit, having seen the crowds on the way up, where the uh, the stations look like the, the district line at rush hour, um, I wasn't that surprised. But if you told me there were going to be crowds like that a year ago, absolutely, I would have been. I'd have been amazed. <laughs> After a refuelling stop at Tyne Yard, the run back to York is smooth. Even at half past midnight, there are still people waiting to greet it. We'll get it back on the shed now and uh, decide uh, for ourselves. And we had a look underneath and had a good feel around. But in terms of performance, uh, couldn't ask for more. Absolutely amazing, effortless. With a big train, just easy. Everything is being done to prepare Tornado for passenger trains on the main line. Ian Matthews is leading the paint job into l &E colours. You've got to keep what we call a wet edge going. Where your edge is, you'll find that it starts to dry off. So when you come along with some more paint, it won't blend in properly because, because of the skin that it's forming. So you need to work quite, quite quickly and to keep that wet edge going along a large side. This colour's apple green. It's a L and ER colour from the 1920s that they used to paint the locomotives in on the eastern region. There's four colour choices for this type of locomotive. Um, this green, there's a blue, and there's two other uh, standard gr greens, British Railways greens. Um, and it was chosen to do it this one first, which is uh, a nice green anyway, really. It really looks the part when it's done with all the lining on. And lining out the loco falls to the steady hands of Tony Philby from the National Railway Museum. It's his last job before he retires. To get a, a full-size mainline steam locomotive in, brand new, uh, is remarkable, to say the least. It's funny, you, uh, you acquire the knack uh, with sign writing, and although you might be uh, uh, dithery at first, once you, once you actually start to, to, to do the line, it flows quite well. It's just a case of having the material right, and it's just one of those things that comes with practice. This uh, is a starting point, but of course it's an A2, but right. it's very much the same period. Yeah. Wherever possible, the trust are following the precedents laid down 60 years beforehand. This top edge of the green the beading, here is yeah. straight, yeah. right through. Again, the lining continuing there over the reversing rod casing yeah where this line is a nice is the equal virtually equal distance to the top from the black yeah. as it is from the foot plate right now i just said I that was a bit low personally I, it is low it looks yeah. wrong and yeah. I, there's only I think on it three would... or four locos and i've got a feeling that this is where darlington got the instructions around their neck to start off with probably um the thing is you've got um a black border around each panel yeah okay about two inches wide the idea is that the edges were black so yeah. when they got damaged they'd have black in the running sheds and they could so they'd be able to touch them yeah. in yeah. yeah and it wouldn't affect the actual main livery panel from a three inch brush to getting a, a good coat of paint on where you're really slapping it on. To doing this stuff is a complete contrast. And this is very delicate, very delicate. But it's, it's the fine tuning, as it were, that just finishes it off nicely. The paint job is completed in time for Tornado to take a bow in its new colors on an inaugural run to London King's Cross 
in early 2009. I've never seen such a large line-side gallery. Wherever we went, platforms, bridges, fields, just people pho photographic and waving. I mean, it was effectively our first public run on its natural main line from uh, Darlington down to King's Cross. Everywhere we've been, it was Really a, a memorable moment, certainly. The tour introduced the A1 to a whole new audience, its profile ever growing. And yet, incredibly, there was still more excitement to come. Thursday, 19th of February, 2009. In the early morning light, A1 Peppercorn Pacific, number 60163, 50th of its class, glints, its paintwork polished as never before. Their Royal Highnesses, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall, will today set the seal on the story, officially naming the locomotive Tornado. Everything has to be double checked, treble checked. All the standards have to be met and everything has to be absolutely in place. And at the moment, this morning, they're just doing a final look round to make sure everything is Okay, from last night. The programme now is just to finish off all the jobs that we did yesterday, final clean round, oil up around the engine, get the fire right, and hopefully within the next hour we'll be finished and we can get ourselves sorted out and uh, go and enjoy the ceremony. No detail will be overlooked. Chris, can I uh, request that you find a very convenient way to fly onto the top and just kick that coal down? I want it all level with so there's just no way it can fall off. We've had to do a complete royal preparation in two days flat. Normally with diesel locomotives that would take a week minimum. In particular DB Schenker, the train operator who have provided the fitness to run examiners, normally this is two to three hours by one person. This time it's been two and a half days by three people and they've gone through the whole locomotive with a fine tooth comb. Uh, which has been useful for us because it has highlighted one or two uh, areas that we weren't aware of, but generally speaking, she's passed fine and there's no big issue. With an hour to go before the ceremony, there's time for a polish of the very last items attached to the locomotive, the nameplates. The final bit of the engine uh, it certainly looks absolutely fantastic with the name plates on. It's absolutely beautiful. We've just been waiting for this moment to put them on because it's the big part of the engine. There's even time for a rehearsal of the unveiling. Over on York Station, preparations have been no less intense. And the crowds are no less eager. Tornado gently slips through the station to take up its position before the royal guests of honour arrive by train. <laughs> You couldn't get better than this, could you? It's the ultimate accolade is to have the Prince of Wales, the Duchess of Cornwall, to name Tornado. The ceremony has been carefully planned for months. I think he's a bit of a closet railway enthusiast. I think he's quite pleased with it. It's uh, a super job. I mean, he, he obviously likes steam engines. I've, I've seen him before in Towin, and he's been on engines there, and he seems to enjoy it. For Dorothy, the day is a mix of emotions. It's wonderful, but it's been fun the whole way. But I never thought I'd see today. As somebody who remembers the days of steam only too well, it really is a special day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, my wife and I would like to declare that this engine is named Tornado, and may God bless 
all who are lucky enough to locomote behind her. Tornado then received the ultimate accolade for any locomotive, the chance to haul the royal train. Their Royal Highnesses travelled on to several engagements elsewhere in Yorkshire, with the Prince at least starting the journey in style. Having travelled down the East Coast main line and then onwards to Leeds, Tornado returned to York with the Royal Train in tow. For a project written off as impossible, pushed along by passionate people who refused to let the idea go and paid for by thousands who shared the vision, it was the ultimate recognition and reward. For once, it is just fantastic to um, not to have to defend your interest, but actually to have people come up to you and say, I can't believe what you and your colleagues have done. That is just amazing. And people who aren't criticizing or finding something humorous about it, but they are in awe of what's been achieved. And that's just fantastic. I'm still pinching myself. I still can't actually believe that if I was to go up to Darlington now, uh, Tornado wouldn't actually be sat in the shed almost finished but not quite. There's not been that much heartache. There's just been an awful lot of hard work by an awful lot of people over a very, very long time. But it's made that hard work feel um, like it was worth doing. In the following months, Tornado proved itself at home on the East Coast Main Line, putting in spectacular performances with heavy trains. It's also travelled far and wide. We did not realise how much people would take it to heart. When we built this, I don't think no one knew what we, we had built or achieved. People's faces, that is the big thing. It's the people's faces when they see it, or they've been on it, or they see it. That is the very good thing about it. So there's a lot of new tourism, different lines, different people seeing it. Uh, it was on the R engine, it didn't go on Great Western, it didn't go on Southern in the original days, probably once or twice in, you know, uh, when it was British Railways. But we went Wales, we went some, uh, two cracking runs up to, into Wales, which was just fantastic. Uh, we'd, you know, the Torbay Specials, which was just unbelievable, uh, going round by Dawlish Warren and different places like that, it was just fantastic. And after the Royal Train, the locomotive starred in an edition of the BBC's Top Gear programme, taking part in a race to the north. Generally speaking, we're getting better performances with each successive trip we make, uh, partly because the engine is running in and it's not as stiff as it was, but equally uh, we're getting the same crews and they're getting more and more accustomed to the loco and making a better job of firing and driving it. And as it's guaranteed to attract attention, Tornado has also been in demand to fly the flag for Britain's railways. At Sheffield, it appeared alongside a modern unit, which shared its name. The ceremony was carried out by Andrew Cook whose company has generously supported the project almost from the start. And may everybody enjoy travelling in it. Thank you. I feel full of admiration for the people that actually built it. Uh, there are a huge number of people that have dedicated most of their, well, most certainly most of their lives for the last 10 or 15 years to achieving this magnificent project. It's a, it's a fantastic piece of kit. If the regulations allowed it, uh, they'd get it up to over 100 very easily. And maybe they'll do that anyway one of these days <laughs> when nobody's looking. 
The Trust certainly has ambitions to regularly operate at 90 miles an hour, beyond the normal 75 limit imposed on steam. For others, the completion of the locomotive was full of mixed emotions. By the time we did steam, I lost my mother and my wife, both in very short succession, both of whom would have loved to have been there and had given it every support uh, while they were alive. And it was quite a poignant moment to, to be the survivor and, and seeing it. I never fully appreciated the degree of interest there would be in the locomotive once it was built and running. I thought, well, the enthusiasts will be interested, but it'll be, to an extent it'll be a you know, two-year wonder. But it's given so much pleasure to so many people. And I, I yes. think that is actually, I think that's been <laughs> worthwhile. In 2010, Tornado met a close relative, the fastest steam locomotive in the world, Mallard. The fellow three-cylinder Pacific was being given a lift to Shildon to be displayed at the National Railway Museum's annex. While it wasn't in steam itself, the illusion was powerful. <coughs> Following a period of maintenance, Tornado has resumed its role as a roving, iconic ambassador for what you can achieve even against the odds. I think an awful lot of people have actually had a dream and they've and a lot of people have said, well, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that, you won't do that, and have proved them to be wrong. And it's almost the satisfaction in, in actually achieving something that people said just couldn't be done. And that's, that's, you know, it makes you feel good.